Hi, good afternoon, folks. A very warm welcome to all of you tuning in. My name is Jan Ambatur, and I'm the creator of live programs here at Nottingham Contemporary. Some of you might already know Nottingham Contemporary is a contemporary art center located in Midlands in the UK. We hope, we hope all of you and your families are well. And um, it's a great pleasure to give you a word of hosting for tonight's conversation between Sonia Levy, uh, environmental anthropologist Heather Swanson, and writer and creator Philippa Ramos to elevate the ideas and knowledge that brought uh, Sonia Levy's uh, new film, Creatures of the Lines, into life. The film is still available on our website for another five days, so do watch it if you haven't had a chance to do so until now. Creatures of the Lines uh, was produced in collaboration with Heather Swanson, and it explores how the desire for economic growth and linear progress has produced straightened farms in England's watery terrains, and ask what risks are associated with the conversion of one's curvy and braided worlds into a linearized landscape. Drawing on, drawing on their long-standing research interests and conversations exploring the risks to and in aquatic ecologies with academics from Loughborough University, the film explores how English waterscapes have been transformed via the construction of canals. As arteries of British Empire, canals linked Indian cotton fields to domestic textile mills, facilitating vast ecological transformations from monoculture or agriculture in the colonies to industrial discharges in England's waters, soils, and air. And thus serve as a key site for exploring often overlooked histories of colonial capitalism and their material presen presences in contemporary worlds. The film is accompanied by a keyword glossary titled A Highly Partial Field Guide to British Canals, Introducing Sound Processes and Beings, prepared by Heather Swanson and Sonia Levy, of which you can find on our website. This event is a collaboration with Radar of Loughborough University and shortly Radar's producer, Laura Perslow, will continue with a separate introduction. Um, our live programs open up different interventions and propositions within our curatorial research across the organization. And this event expands on our current research trend, Emergency in Emergence, a multi-platformed program that unearths transdisciplinary sensorial and speculative practices of theoretical sense making and wayfinding via questions of repair, pedagogy, remediation, and mutation to investigate how to move from crisis to renewal, from emergency to emergence. Some very brief housekeeping notes before I introduce our guests. Our live programs of talks, performances, and screenings seek to create challenging environments where open-mindedness and respect for each other's, uh, each other's approaches and perspectives can foster growth. So please be mindful and respectful of each other's opinions and views. We will keep an informal atmosphere throughout the evening, and although interaction with our audiences is limited in today's digital formats, we welcome you to join the conversation. You can use the chat on YouTube to write your questions and comments throughout this session, and Philippa will be asking those to our, uh, to our speakers. Our session will last approximately an hour and 30 minutes. I'll, I will also like to take this opportunity to thank our partners, the University of Nottingham and Nottingham Trent University for their generous support of our programs, as well as my colleagues, Helen Hamilton, Jim Brower, and Shannon Charlesworth for making this event possible. As with all events here at Nottingham Contemporary, today's event is free to attend, but all donations are greatly appreciated to help support future free programs. Please donate if you can and are feeling um, generous this evening. So without further delay, I'm very pleased to introduce our speakers. Sonia Levy um, is an artist and filmmaker currently based in London, actually today joining us from Venice uh, for her residency there. Um, her practice engages contemporary socio-ecological urgencies at the intersection of art and science. Through this co-becoming of disciplines, she uses filmmaking to query science's history of entanglement with the logic of Western colonial extractivism. Her work attempts to develop new practices of care that foster dialogue as a means to consider new worlds. Heather Ann Swanson is Associate Prof Professor of Anthropology at Aarhus University, as well as di the Director of the Aarhus University Center for Environmental Humanities. With a long-standing interest in fish, rivers, and oceans, her current work broadly explores how political economies and ecologies are intertwined. 
She has been a founding member of several research groups that focus on transdisciplinary methods and collaborations among the natural science, social sciences and arts, and is a co-editor of Domestication Gone Wild, Politics and Practices of Multispecies Relations, published by Duke University Press, and Arts of Living on a Dam Dam Damaged Planet, published by Minnesota University Press. Her newest book, Spawning Modern Fish, Transnational Comparison in the Making of Japanese Salmon, is forthcoming from University of Washington Press and will be published in August 2022. Philippa Ramos is a writer and creator uh, with a PhD awarded from the School of Critical Studies at Kingston University, London. Her research manifested in critical and theoretical texts, lectures, workshops, and edited publications, focuses on how culture addresses ecology, attending to how contemporary arts fosters relationships between nature and technology. She is the director of the Contemporary Art Department of the City of Porto. Uh, furthermore, she is the creator of uh, the Art Basel film section and a founding creator of the online artist Cinema Vidrom. Uh, ongoing and upcoming projects include the Arts, Humanities and Science Festival, The Shape of a Circle in the Mind of a Fish since 2018, and Persons, Person, Personen, and the 8th Biennial Gardina, both with Lucia Petroschin. She lectures extensively in the fields of contemporary art and ecology. She is a lecturer at the master program of the Arts Institute of the Hochschule Nordwest Schweiz in Berlin, where she leads the art and nature seminars. I'm going to hand it over to Lara now. So without further ado, the screen is yours, Lara. Thank you. Thank you, Tanan. Um, I'm just pleased to briefly um, say a little bit about the radar program uh, through which this film was uh, commissioned. So um, radar is a commissioning and research program based at Loughborough University, which creates opportunities for artists who work in collaboration with academic researchers. Um, radar produces a program of commissions and critical debate. Um, which is produced by my colleague David Bell, um, which invites artists to engage with research and develop new work. Um, our projects often engage with the two kind of concepts of our, excuse me, our campus. Um, the light's just gone off in my room. Um, so in uh, East Midlands and in uh, London, and um, they're also often hosted by our um, institutional partners across the UK. Um, the work we produce is performative, participatory and process based and radar projects are very much cross disciplinary and favour collaborative models which seek to advance the ways in which we think about research. Um, recent projects include Bodies of Knowledge, a programme departing from a series of artist led workshops exploring the human body as a site for the production, retention and transformation of knowledge um, and our current programme, Ecological Thinking, which asks how artists and researchers might think and do ecology differently, considering the colonial and enlightenment modes of thinking which have underpinned the study of ecology and asking how a more porous approach might help to collapse those binaries and boundaries which uh, maintain the hierarchies we want to erode. Um, Creatures of the Lines was commissioned in 2019 as part of Risk Related, which was a program with which we wanted to engage across the university uh, in almost every department, thinking about uh, risk um, from the existential risks we face pol politically and ecologically to the intimately connected ways in which chance and risk dominate the logics of global finance, um, but while also sort of holding on to the ways in which chance and risk have been central to modern and contemporary art and hold potential for new kind of ways of thinking and modes of being. Um, and Creatures of the Lions does exactly what we hope these projects will do and really operates to cut across subject areas, makes connections between ecology capitalism, colonialism, um, and absolutely sort of embraces that idea of uh, risky methodology in the way it's made in the sense of kind of filming underwater being very much about sort of chance encounter. So um, 
collaboration with academics is really central to radar commissions. And Sonia spent time with Professor of Ecohydrology Paul Wood, um, engaging with his research on invasive species in canalways. Um, so the so-called killer shrimp that um, you can read about in the highly partial field guide to uh, British canals that Chanan mentioned. Um, so from those kind of early um, days surveying species within the canals with Paul, um, Sonia, and then working with Heather, um, really over time grew this project to kind of think really broadly about shipping and trade and how that kind of disperses these species so widely across the systems um, of canals through movement and um, gets into these really kind of knotty connections between colonialism, capitalism and intensive agriculture um, that all sort of come into focus um, in this film through the uh, sort of embodied by the creatures of the lines and the worlds they inhabit. So um, we're just really happy to have um, commissioned this film and to see it uh, screened today. So thank you. Hi, um, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Janan and, and Laura for uh, this introduction. Uh, and thanks everyone who's uh, joining in this evening. So uh, yeah, Heather and I will uh, now present some uh, background around the work. Um, uh, and just as we begin our talk, uh, we just want to first acknowledge that the world around us um, are suffering in many ways. Uh, ecologically, um, as we discussed today, but also from other uh, unacceptable violences, uh, including those of wars. Um, so I will uh, now um, share my screen. Yes, it's working, I think. Uh, so yeah, I would like to thank uh, Radar Lothborough and Laura and David Bell and Paul Wood and uh, Simon Goreski and I, David Rives uh, and their student Sarah Evans and Daniel uh, Gwenster from Lothborough Geography Department and the many uh, collaborators and friends who have helped us um, and worked with us along the way. Uh, their generosity and feedbacks have also made this film possible. Um, so as uh, Laura mentioned, the project was uh, commissioned by RADAR and it draws uh, on conversation and collaboration with uh, physical geographers from Lothborough University uh, looking into uh, current socio-ecological concerns affecting UK water bodies. Um, so issues around newly arrived uh, aquatic species in man-made water bodies and how canals are facilitating the dispersal and spread, as well as the increased uh, eutrophication of British waters, uh, the process by which nutrients accumulate in aquatic habitats uh, tied to the use of agricultural fertilizers runoff, as well as sewage discharge. Um, and we will explain uh, both of these in more detail uh, later. So those were um, issues that are brought to our attention uh, by our collaborators from Lothbury University. Um, as part of the project, we also uh, conducted a scientific study on canals. Um, and uh, um, under UK law, canals are largely unmonitored and are still uh, managed as infrastructure of transportation. So this results in very little knowledge about these water bodies, even though they have substantial ecological effect as they pour into adjacent rivers and streams and often connect previously separated watersheds, facilitating pollutant and organism dispersal. So uh, we conducted a biotic survey into canal comparing different assemblages of macro invertebrates found in different parts of canals in London, and we are currently still processing the data um, and are optimistic that will, that will give indication of uh, canal water quality uh, with certain species uh, acting as a biological indicator, uh, as well as uh, habitat structures, um, because particular organisms only reside in specific condition and in relation to specific habitats. 
so uh, in certain plants or substrates. Um, and also we hope that they would give indication of uh, biotic, uh, potential biotic homogenization, which means uh, the decrease uh, in locally distinct biodiversity, which is a phenomenon that is accelerated by extinction and species introduction, as well as by the smaller number of species that can live in a uh, water body like canal, which is morphologically and ecologically quite unusual. And many of our samples uh, contain uh, introduced organisms who were not previously documented at these uh, localities. Uh, the framing of the project draws on my collaborator Heather work and her research group on ecological globalization. And I will hand it to Heather for her to explain in more detail this uh, project. Thanks, Sonia. And thanks to everyone who's made this event possible. Um, Creatures of the Lines draws its academic inspiration in large part from a research group I head uh, funded by the Carlsberg Foundation, which focuses on what we call ecological globalizations. That research group is interested in how political and economic processes come to link spatially distant ecologies in various ways. For example, we are interested in how commodity chains shape uh, landscapes through extraction, how the movements of non-humans are remade through human activities, how models for infrastructure building travel among countries, and how circulating desires for growth and modernity remake places. How, we ask, do everyday political and economic acts come to shape the sinews of our worlds, the fibers, tissues, and forms of its lands, waters, and bodies? Creatures of the Lines takes up these multiplicities by trying to shift dominant framings of invasive and introduced species, uh, which often tie the risks of species introductions and ecological disruption to newly arrived organisms themselves. In contrast, we seek to explore how the risky entities that most fundamentally disrupt aquatic worlds are not these organisms as such, but rather infrastructures of shipping, trade, and waterscape modification the structural processes that scramble aquatic, aquatic worlds and remake land water interfaces through channelization and canal building. Today, Britain is crisscrossed by over 2000 miles of canals. For the most part, these canals are not improved rivers, but channels dug specifically for the purpose of transport. One of the ways they upend freshwater environments is by connecting them to distant oceans. Ocean vessels frequently carry, uh, carry organisms from plankton, worms, and algae to clams, mussels, and jellies on their holes and in their ballast water. With the canal networks, introduced organisms do not remain at coastal ports, but are pulled deep into freshwater environments by the movements of smaller boats, as well as by the canal's physical form. Because the canal network connects so many of England's river basins, introduced species are able to quickly spread through them and across the country, displacing others and leading to decreases in biodiversity. The very form of canals facilitates the proliferation and movement of introduced species. Canals were made for efficient conveyance and commerce, straight with hard banks and routine dredging to keep them navigable. Such conditions are, are inhospitable to many organisms, creating worlds where only a limited number of creatures can survive, such as the introduced zebra mussels who flourish on the concrete edges of docklands and canals. We do not see this spread of introduced species as a story of aggressive invading organisms, but rather as a story of waterscapes remade by the structures of transoceanic imperialism and global shipping. To offer another example, as Sonia mentioned earlier, the canals in the film suffer from algal blooms, fluctuating levels of oxygen, and disrupted ecological webs due to eutrophication or excessive plant growth. When waterways are flooded with nutrients, primarily nitrogen and phosphorus, it spurs aquatic plants and microalgae communities to proliferate, giving waters a vivid green hue. Rather than seeing eutrophication merely as a technical pollution problem, we approach it in a more expansive geographical and historical perspective, a move that brings eutrophication into view as an emblematic example of wider structural forms. The most significant cause of eutrophication 
is a dramatic increase in fertilizer use in England from the 19th century onward. Once derived from, nitrogen, nit from nutrient fixing legumes and animal dung, nitrogen began to be imported from sites such as Peru's Guano Islands and later produced within post-World War II factories whose outputs were converted from bomb materials to agricultural additives. Phosphorus initially came from Pacific Islands forced into imperial relations with Britain and more recently from Morocco. The histories of both nutrients extraction, shipping and use within monocrop agriculture, which has both made and fed urban growth, have become literally embodied in canal ecologies. In this way, they offer a key example of how industrial processes seep into the world's metabolism. In a related vein, Sonia and I also build on the Ecological Globalization Project's commitment to thinking with material worlds. In particular, its focus on material transformations of land waterscapes. This focus on materiality matters for how we invoke lines in the film. We do not see lines as metaphors or mere concepts. We are thinking about them as material forms, as canals, factory lines, crop rows, and is bound up with other material tools, such as the lines of the accounting ledger and the survey equipment of the engineer. Although very interested in and respectful of the multifaceted human worlds of canals, like the laborers who built them, uh, current longboat dwellers. Um, in this piece, we made a specific choice to focus on the infrastructures of canals in relation to their non-human denizens. Although in future work, we may expand our scope. Overall, the film is inspired by various scholarly trajectories, including more than human anthropology, Marxist feminist geography, and feminist science and technology studies. Another aspect of our work is, it's, is a commitment to encounter-based methods. Rather than knowing the subject in advance, we allowed the key questions and topics to emerge via joint work, following the flux of the world, rather than having a straight line plan from project start to finish. Instead, we've intentionally slowing down, working with seasonality and cycles. In thinking through these questions, we have put an emphasis on collaboration. By working together, we seek to join the speculative, open possibilities of art and its attention to aesthetics with the thick description and place-based noticing of anthropological traditions, al along with the noticing practices of natural history and aquatic ecology, the latter thanks to the help of Paul Wood. For us, there is a sense of urgency. We are stumbling to learn more about the confusing worlds and ecological dilemmas with which we're entangled. And we hope cross-disciplinary collaboration might help us to explore new ways of sensing, noticing, and experiencing lines as a first step towards transforming them into more livable and more curvy and meandering forms. Another key method for us has been historical research, which due to COVID-19 largely meant engagement with digitized archives and other online materials. We do not approach history as in the metaphor of sedimentary layers of tidy uh, organized accretions. Rather, we see histories um, like the actual sediments of a canal, churned up by passing boats, dredged, continually resuspended, ingested by clams, and saturating bodies and waters. We thus present nonlinear historical fragments to emphasize how histories and presence are bound up with each other. In other words, how pasts are not past. We also focus on histories in form, like those in the physical brick and mortar of the canals, to emphasize drawing on the thinking of anthropologist Anne Stoller, how the debris of empire is not a collection of ephemeral traces, but of seriously durable imprints in lands, waters, and lives, human and non-human. In our efforts to have robust citation and historical detail, we decided to develop the document that accompanies the film with keywords and bibliographic sources, which we hope you've had a chance to access. Um, I now pass the word back to Sonia to say a bit more about the project's filming practices. Sonia, back to you. 
So uh, throughout the project, we have attempted to think from the water, from the murky, thick and submerged sites of canals and their unsettled layer of socioecologies. Most of the film attempt to bring seldom seen sites of the underside of London's waterway, a laborious process involving the development of an underwater camera system. Uh, we wanted to disrupt some of the practices of representation embedded in lines of progress in the making of canals, the reshaping of the world for imperial and product productionist projects. So how, for example, watery spaces have been defined by the West as the other than reason in opposition to the terra firma, the stable ground on which enlightened rationality claims to be built on, or equally how it was cast as a historical empty voids rendered flat surfaces for conquest and accumulation. In place, we wanted to repopulate and give uh, depth back to these watery spaces. Um, another practice of representation embedded in lines of progress we wish to interrupt is the view from above, the God's eye view of traditional cartography and surveying, which played a part in the making of canal and the rendering of the world amenable to the modernist plan. So a disembodied position, sorry, disengaged from the materiality of the world and the extraction imaginary of this position has made a terra nullis out of landscapes, lands and waters ready to be conquered and grabbed, erasing the words and worlds of others. As a reaction against this position, we want to represent what it would mean to be immersed in the world, entangled, in, entangled with the work of other living beings, um, we want to represent an enfoldment in the cycle of the earth. Uh, that said, we don't regard immersion as inherently uh, liberatory or water as a substance that necessarily dissolves selves and structures. Instead, we want to think about the specific ways the materialities of watery world have and are being shaped and transformed. So I'll just add a few words about some of the creative and filming practices that have uh, formed my thinking and aesthetics around this film. So the work of filmmaker Jean Pinlevé and Geneviève Amont uh, and their early cinematic and aquatic tales where the scientific cross experimental filmmaking um, and the work of anthropologist and filmmaker Trinity Minha and her practice of speaking nearby as opposed to speaking about so to not speak from a position of authority and to attempt to work without grabbing, capturing or enclosing in order to instead let things come to oneself uh, in all their liveliness. So throughout the film, uh, we have attempted to develop methods and ways of knowing, but also retelling uh, and representing these confusing worlds and ecological dilemmas with which we are entangled. Uh, the muddle, the perturb, and the uncertain were a notion we developed and attempted to include in our ways of approaching the field and the filming, as well as notion we wish to be embodied in the language uh, and aesthetics of the film. So thank you. Um, and now that we've put this uh, men ideas and method on the table, um, we very much look forward to begin our conversation with you, Philippa. Uh, hello, I was, are we meant to start already? Just because I, okay, good, <laughs> thank you. Um, this was um, an extraordinary presentation, Sonia Heather. It made my, my role quite redundant because uh, um, you need very little um, moderation for your thoughts and ideas and the sharing of your joint process of, of work to emerge. Um, and um, maybe I see my role here as uh, um, in asking some questions that tell us more about the story of this project, which I think is always interesting to see how it emerges. And, um, and while I was now listening to you and also re-watching the film this afternoon, um, something that um, occurred to me in a very vivid way is or how or something that emerges very clearly from 
from the work that you made together is how um, ecology is an aesthetic issue in the sense that you your research attests very clearly to how the trans to the consequences of these systematic transformations of landscape, these gestures of straightening, of conceiving a line and a vector as um, a system that is more efficient, more um, profitable, and also a form and a shape that are more efficient, and therefore how it is so important to approach um, the complexities of, of ecology also taking into account its aesthetic um, resonance or its aesthetic roots. No? How a transformation of, of a landscape leads to, to a, a, a radical transformation in, and in the environment in, and in the relationships um, that life forms establish with, with those environments. And um, having said this, I would be very curious to know about the beginning of this process, how, how this project came into being, what, let's say, what was its initial line of desire, line of inquiry and, and ambitions and, uh, and how did also this very happy collaboration between the two of you came into being. So, how, yes, if you want to tell us a little bit of the, the story of the birth of this project. Should I say something? <laughs> okay, I'll start. Um, actually, what you just said, Philippa, thank you so much for this um, great comment. Uh, actually, actually reminded me about um, a paper that Heather has written that also uh, for me, it was really important in inviting Heather in the project, and uh, which is about her idea about the banality of the Anthropocene. Um, and I wonder, Heather, also, if you want to, to say something more about that, how also and what also, uh, in a way, drove the, this project was uh, that we are confronted with those changes, but we don't always have uh, we don't always see them. Uh, they become sort of invisible. And I think the gesture of filming in, on the water in Canal was also because of that, because uh, we don't often see canals as uh, living entities uh, with life in them. Um, and I think I, I, I was really interested in reversing that. Um, um, yeah. And maybe Heather, you want to say something also about, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, from my part, I was um, simply thrilled when uh, Sonia approached me about this project um, and with the opportunity to collaborate because um, it was a real privilege for me to have that chance. Um, and I think it is precisely the, the chance to work um, with an artist who was able to do what, Son what Sonia just mentioned, to take that uh, everydayness of these aesthetics of straightness, of linearization, and to make those seem overlooked, the ordinary, the to make that ordinary strange and to make it, to make it visible so that it's um, engageable and discussable in a different way. Um, and um, I think that, I mean, we also have to remember that these, that these, that these everyday structures, um, they're not inherently overlooked. They're just made so abundant that they no longer, uh, that they've become normalized into the landscape, but there isn't anything um, inherent, like, uh, inherently given, uh, indeed they are strange, um, but that these forms such as canals and linearization in our landscape um, have just proliferated to the degree that we take them as ordinary. So bringing back in that um, a different sense of attention to them seems 
precisely um, one of the important ways to engage um, the ecological challenges of our times, that, that sense of denaturalization. Yeah, and I think that's what also working with Heather has been um, so incredible for me and has really challenged my thinking is because the way sometimes you, you phrase like those structure that we, that are so normalized that they are actually maybe world that shouldn't be. Um, and that also changed my approach to, to them and how I wanted to engage with them and what I wanted to say. It's, um, it's super interesting what you're saying because it's making me think, while you were speaking, Heather, now, um, it was making me think how we, were, we have been brought up um, in a world where grids and lines, uh, straight lines, because lines can be curved as well, but we have, we have been so much used to a system of grids and of straight lines that they almost naturalize themselves, not only in our visual culture and in our, relation, our visual relationship to the world, but also in the ways in which we conceive our, our processes to think. Websites, system architecture relies on grids as well. Um, the ways we, we communicate, the, the ways we organize our thoughts and how the there is a, semiotics, but also a visual culture of the grid and of the line that it naturalizes itself as a system, both of efficiency, but also of control and of dominance. You know? And if we think about um, mechanisms to, for instance, well, if we think how different disciplinary ambits um, use the grid from archeology span to study a field, to studies even in, in ecology and in environment. I'm thinking about a text that Bruno Latour uh, wrote about soil researchers and how they, they do this research by creating grids. No? Um, it, it, all of a sudden, we, we realize that infrastructure, both major as the construction of canals and of, uh, of ways of, of transit and circulation distribution of goods, but also minor infrastructures are generally relying on, on, this, uh, on this very, very coded and very, very um, imposive and dominant system of, of, on, on this geometry of lines. You know? and, and, uh, and having said this, very often the system is also used to control from above and to see from above. And Sonia, before you were exactly mentioning how important it is to go back to the ground, go to the mud, a little bit like Donna Haraway mentions that she feels she's a creature of the mud now, and to give a perspective that is muddy as we are right now, that we, we all have this, we're all literally embedded in the muddiness of the film. Um, and I was curious, um, while you were describing the, 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 the process of conceiving the, the visuals of the film, I was actually very curious about the very down to worth pragmatic aspects of, of filming, um, of making this film. Can you tell us more about how the cameras were installed, where you choose the locations where these cameras were placed or if they were already there? Because the, the, the cameras are, are super interesting exactly by taking us outside of these grids or inside, let's say, the lines mm -hmm. and making us uh, watch exactly what is happening. So it would, I would be really, really curious to know more about the materiality and the practicity of, of the camera work in the film. Yes, thank you for that. Um, so the camera, I, I developed um, a quite simple system in a way. Uh, my camera is housed in an underwater camera system and I'm above the water. <laughs> Uh, holding it with a with a pole um, and um, it took a it took a really a lot of take of course and uh, to find the right 
I, yeah, to find the right way to make this this apparatus work. Uh, and then finally, I, I had uh, I find a way to have a live view. So that really helped and also a very practical thing, but to also see what I was filming uh, while I was filming it and discovering it and being able to frame. And that raised it, of course, a lot of other questions about uh, about framing, uh, about thinking about what it means to to capture destruction and the sort of aestheticization of, of, of that destruction and how certain images look so painterly and so romantic sometimes. So this was always in the in the back of my head when I was filming, but I really tried to uh, spend uh, as much time as possible and see through different condition and different weather and yeah, what the, canal <laughs> waters have told me and filming on the water has kind of teach me is also uh, that it's not like you have to be not only extremely patient but you as I was also alluding to earlier like you have to let the world come to you you cannot ask the world to behave a certain way and that was um, how also I wanted to approach the field of course but there is uh, forms of weather on the water. There is days where the, the visibility is really bad. Sometimes, of course, because it has rain, but from sometimes for reason unknown. Um, so that was really, really interesting. And seasonality was also really important. And in terms of uh, choosing the location, um, they were also linked to the location where we did the scientific uh, survey, which were um, some some basin that had very different uh, morphologies and that were treated quite differently. Some in areas that were much more um, urbanized and that look at least from outside potentially more damaged or polluted or more full of detritus. And then others where there would be attempt at uh, a planting, replanting the edges. Uh, there was also, so I was also really interested uh, to follow um, to follow that that line from the from the container port to the the River Thames to the the entrance of the canal system. So there is all that. Um, that sec section that was filmed also in London, uh, in Canary Wharf in London Docklands. And that was incredibly interesting and difficult to get also a permit to film there. Obviously I couldn't go anywhere I wanted. Uh, and the ecology was so, so different as well, uh, much more deep. And so, yeah, that's, um, that was part of <laughs> how I approached the film. Thank you. And um, Heather, I, I was also curious to know um, what was your relationship to the, the production of these images and to the encounter with these images, if they are, because um, they're so outlandish somehow and so fantastic. You, I feel like I'm, I could be in a Martian world also, maybe it's because of the greenish nature of them. No? But I was wondering, um, aside from the aesthetic encounter, that maybe is the one I have straight away with, with the footage, um, I'm curious to know, maybe I'm just simply curious to know how an um, environmental anthropologist or an anthropologist deeply, um, deeply uh, rooted in in ecology and environmental matters looks at this footage and, and relates to this, to the, these visuals that, that we see in the film. Yeah, thanks so much for that question. Um, I think the first answer is, um, unfortunately, because of the timing of the filming in the depths of COVID-19 lockdown, um, I wasn't able to be present but our original vision was for this to be jointly ethnographic and uh, cinemagraphic fieldwork. So that I would have been there in the field as an anthropologist 
um, at the same time that Sonia was doing um, the filming. So I did encounter these, um, I did encounter the canals uh, in this in the filming period, uh, largely through uh, the filmmaking, um, through uh, Sonia sending uh, sending uh, uh, reams and reams of, uh, <laughs> of of video imagery for me to engage, um, and um, and it was it was both a bit strange for me as someone who was schooled in methods of uh, intimate encounter to do that uh, digital work at a distance. But I think it was also, um, it pulled me into a different practice of noticing, of paying attention to the details in the filming, to asking questions about the textures and materials on the side of canals, to asking Sonia questions about the roots, to asking what was this and what was that. And so I think there's a way that the constraints of that moment also brought us into uh, into a different kind of dialogue where I had to ask um, all kinds of questions from my uh, disciplinary background. Like I was really shocked by the eutrophication, like the degree of eutrophication. The water is, as you said, so profoundly green, um, which was part of the process that I mentioned, the eutrophication I mentioned earlier to see how, how much you could really see that in the water. Um, I think, you know, we were also very interested in the way that, um, Sonia, you can say more about this, that the snails were particularly on plastic substrates, for example. Um, and I think it was also that the, the video work was also bringing us into deeper and deeper conversation with Paul, with, uh, with Paul Wood as well. Um, and I think, um, I think there's also a way that the, the footage made me slow down in a really productive way because precisely its encounter it, that is produced um, in sort of these like patchy fragmentary moments, like Sonia said, with multiple takes in different places and partial failures and partial successes with the filming um, disrupted the sense of being able to do a project from start to finish, which that idea that you start a project and you know exactly what you're going to do and then you work through it systematically and you get to an endpoint is in itself a form of that straight line thinking where you, you, know, you have a neat and tidy narrative line that goes from beginning to end. And I think the very process, uh, Sonia's very process of filming brought us into a different type of space of dialogue um, and engagement where um, we could produce uh, new conversations. Yeah, I, can I just add something briefly? I feel like what started to happen is that actually the, the, the images and the filming became at once methods and processes to to study those worlds, uh, and then and then they became part of the film as well, um, and also partly this was due because <laughs> Paul Wood, which engaged with us, uh, which is the eco, uh, eco, eco hydrologist who worked with us, uh, again because of COVID, we were supposed to work more closely with him and on different canal system. Uh, couldn't be present either. So in a way it forced uh, also another, another approach, another method to get to know those waters with the camera. Okay, here we are. Sorry, I was seeing the slides so I was understanding if we were meant to continue or not. Um, thank you. Um, and uh, it's not only images, but the sound of the film is incredible. Yes. The sound, both the sound that emerges from these environments, um, as well as then 
and we go there to the layers of of voices and and of narratives that also take us to different times and different moments um, adding an element of uh, um, adding a, or diluting what is actually science and what is fiction in a way but I wonder if you could tell us more about um, how you edited the sound how you worked with the sound um, what was your interest in 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 creating this very layered um, at times very material and very situated sound and the times taking us to other moments and, and times yeah, so um, I recorded, uh, so er, as much as the mode sort of film is on the, on the record, as well with contact microphone, I, actually a little bit above water, around water. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was about having all those little details and being able also to, to have the sound where, uh, where I filmed. So, for example, we went to um, Canary Wharf, where there was those um, edges completely covered with those zebra mussel and recorded there and have this like crackling sound. So, um, so to also, even though the sound was not necessarily recorded and was then uh, composed on top of the image later, um, it was really important to have um, the sound uh, that the creature produced or the sound of the specific localities. Um, and what I try to emphasize a lot also is um, there's a lot of like uh, working um, construction sites and metal noises, uh, which uh, for me became also the, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, um, the sort of, um, it, is, it is like also the soundtrack of London, this, this city that is constantly being built and all those uh, buildings that are being uh, erased. Uh, and, um, um, and the concretization, this constant concretization of the world and this constant remaking. So I wanted to be, to have that really also materially present in the work uh, in the soundtrack of the work so uh, we had uh, we went also to a space near Canary Wharf where they just were uh, doing this really big construction site and were able to record uh, record that on the water so they are not uh, sound that were uh, sort of transformed but they're really record there on the water um, and then um, there's this other other layer, which is um, the voiceover, uh, and maybe Heather could say a little bit more also about the choice uh, the choice of those poems and those texts. Uh, um, and the idea here was to bring more um, a historical perspective also uh, on canals and also the sort of hauntings of those waters. And the attempt was also to to um, to at once animate some of those arch archival voices, but also see how they are still sort of present in those in those waters, and they're still this sort of <laughs> distor distorted and uh, actively present there. Um, Philippa, shall I just jump in on Sonia's question? Yes, back. Yes. yes. Um, so yeah, uh, just to follow up quickly, um, uh, it's precisely as Sonia just started to explain that we were interested in um, a sense of uh, history as being churned, um, as being present in the canals, that history isn't something past, um, but is something that is in the present, yet it's not in the present in this, uh, it's not a linear history where you can, everything is, you know, accreted in accreted sequences, but that the history is churned and just, and uh, thrown up and, but they're definitely, it's there, yet it's not in a neat and tidy arranged uh, straight line fashion. And so that's why we have um, lines of a poem, lines of poetry that uh, come back in these patchy, 
uh, ways and that are spoken um, in different ways throughout the film. And just um, hopefully people have a chance to take a look at the accompanying PDF, but um, we tried to pick pieces that were very relevant. So there are two 18th century poems. Um, one specifically references um, British, uh, is inspired by British Canal. Um, the other is about a moment of trade that is uh, contemporary, contemporaneous with this large period of uh, canal building and increase in shipping. The other is from a different temporal period from the 17th century, from 17th century reflections about drain, drainings of the fens, um, which was another moment of um, uh, canal building and um, drainage. Uh, in England, but uh, in sort of a different phase than the um, than the canals we're looking at, but yet also uh, there were technologies and echoes across those uh, projects as well. Thank you, Heather. It's fascinating how um, I don't know what's the I mean each each spectator has a different experience. For me, it was I I saw the film before knowing the the genealogy and the different the different textual sources that emerged uh, that the text uh, presents and uh, and some of them almost like I remember the first time I saw it the opening voice seemed almost like a curse or like uh, a prophecy more than a curse and others then um, seem to 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 tell about a present and the, the language is clearly uh, from a different moment or from a different um, space but it tells something that we can recognize very closely in the present and I thought it was so interesting then learning how these sources some of them remote to centuries past or most of them how they seem exactly like prophecies or they they seem to announce what we're living. Um, and, um, and so maybe just wanting to go a little bit deeper or stay a little bit deeper with the, with, with the oral aspects and, and now going from, from the sound, we may go back because there's also a question in the audience about it, but staying with the oral aspects of the film, can you tell us more about the research that was made um, in in order to include these texts and these fragments and these very unique accounts that tell um, histories of trade, of unfairness, of transformation of landscapes and people and, and all different living forms that you made and that become so incredibly lucid, but also so outlandish in relation to the images that we see in the film. Sonia, can I just say a few words about the research process and then I'll pass it back to you? Yeah, um, of course, it's more. Yeah, yeah. but I think, um, so for the, for the research, um, this is such a tiny, tiny bit of the research that went into this. Um, what we did, is, you know, I mean, one of the things is that this is a time period and a place where there is no shortage of sources. Um, so there's quite a lot of secondary literature on, um, on canals. Um, there's also quite a lot of primary source material. People were writing manuals about canal building. Um, they were writing soon after they were building, right after they were done, they were writing tourist pamphlets. Or, or sorry, like as the canals uh, changed shape, there were also like travel guides to the canals. Um, there are industrial, there are records of the shipping that was happening on these canals. Um, there, there's um, in Britain you have excellent uh, digitized newspaper, historical newspaper. Uh, archives. So there's just a wealth of sources. Um, and these are just some of the examples of um, materials we were using. There are also broader uh, primary source treatises on uh, canal building in other places. For example, when Britain was building, uh, or when Britain was involved with the Suez, um, there are uh, 
a large number of um, there's a large number of British reflections on uh, the Suez and its uh, and on like the engineering of uh, ocean canals, as well as uh, Brits were also writing quite a lot about the Panama Canal. So, and when they were writing about these new canal projects, they were also often reflecting on inland canals. So you can also read sort of from like the 19th century reflections back to the 18th century and so on. So we were reading across a whole wide variety of sources um, of which, and then the question was which ones would best um, would come together aesthetically with, um, with the imagery. Um, and so Sonia, maybe I'll pass it back to you to say a little bit about um, these particular pieces. Yeah, there is um, three poems in total and there is two poems that are, one is specifically about canals and canal building, which is the, the one at the beginning and the other is more um, a sort of, um, um, which is more about trade. Um, so we wanted to bring those two in a relation as well, um, which was, um, I think, yeah, which was not easy at the beginning to, to find something that would evoke both of those at once. Um, the sort of glorification of trade and the one about canal was a little bit more had it a little bit more ambiguous, but still there is still this um, um, this this yeah this glor the glorification of the project and 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 the sense of the um, the scale of the work uh, and the change in the landscape that happened at the time when it uh, when the canal were dug, um, and then there is the poem that comes in the middle. Uh, which is not with a voice, but just with the subtitle, which is uh, the poem that Heather mentioned, which is a 17th century poem, um, which is relate more to uh, the draining of the fence. But we thought um, it was an interesting sort of um, lineage of hydrological modification in Britain to bring in. And also, um, which is also like a first voice of, of concern in a way. Uh, that we also thought it was interesting to uh, to bring in the work uh, to yeah with with the work we're doing to 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 also raise the fact that um, those ecological changes um, for even in the seventeenth century um, had already uh, people that were quite that were questioning such projects. And indeed, as you said, Philippa, it's incredible to hear and how they still feel so <laughs> contemporary. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, there is, just to continue a little bit on the sound, there is someone who is interested in, in, more, in knowing more specific um, details about, about the sound. And I'm going to read. She asks, I'm curious to know how you negotiate sound and the sonic imagination in the work, how the vibrational permeates, persuades, challenges, informs our accepted ideas of time, space, and such. Um, I don't know who of you um, want to go there. You can you can find, I believe, the, the question in the chat if you need to reread it. Yeah, um, I think that with the challenging the idea of of time, I think we, we sort of um, talk a little bit through that, but um, I think it was mainly through um, through those voices and those poems that we will try to have a sort of echoing or reverberation or hauntings uh, in the water, um, um, suspension, uh, like a thickness of time. Um, and of past that are not past, um, that are not gone, still very much within um, those waters within us. And um, I mean, uh, as I also yeah mentioned before, I think I, I really try to um, bring forth this sort of um, 
reshaping, transforming and constant sort of <laughs> tapping on, on the earth and concretization uh, of the earth that I, I really wanted to, to bring that in the, in the soundtrack together with all the um, granulosity of the little uh, creatures we managed to capture the fishes clicking uh, and the, <laughs> the muscle filtering and all of that. So, um, yeah. Um, thank you. Um, in the sonic aspects of the film, but also in the visual ones, something I find extremely compelling is how it very naturally attests to the indistinction between, let's say, the synthetic and the natural, mm -hmm. um, to the extent that in some fragments you don't know, and you don't even need to know if you're looking at a living or non-living form. I'm bearing. I'm thinking specifically. There's a an initial moment in which um, an, like the body of a clam is filmed, but it could be a cloud, it could be some dirt, it could be like a violet body appearing in the screen. No? And it's so curious since we've been, I mean, it's been um, so long now that we keep asking ourselves, who is the responsible for the nature culture divide and how can we contribute to, um, to bring back this dilution between the two. And all of a sudden in a short film that becomes very clear that this, this, this distinction, even in terms of perception is not that clear and is blurred. No? Um, and, um, and therefore, I don't know if this is really a question, but I was very curious to know um, your relation to the production of images and to the encounter of these bodies, of these movements, of these forms, that exactly because they are in murky waters, because they're in the mud, because they're in a, an area that is so alien for, for us and we're and I love that you finish the glossary with turbidity as the, like, the closing term that defines where you were and where you took us in this film. Um, so I was wondering if, if you want to tell us more about the relationship you have to these um, manifestations of the living and the non-living that seem to so happily coexist. Um, independently of any of the differentiations that we we need in order to to make sense of the world. Should I start, Heather? Or do you... <laughs> okay. thank you, Philippa. Um, yeah. Um... Or if you want, just practically, if you tell us a little bit about this incredible clam that looks like a ghost and looks like an octopus, but also looks like some blurb of pollution. <laughs> Corbicula. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, no, what I can say maybe about also, which is another way that I encountered this uh, relation between living and non-living is... Um, in my engagement or like while working, while filming, um, um, is I, I, <laughs> how can I say that? Sorry. Um, well, first what <laughs> working with Kennel taught me, um, and I don't know if it's gonna make sense, but I realized that life, um, um, or I realize it, 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 it bring forth this idea that life is not uh, an exception on the earth, right? It's the, it's the condition. Um, it's the very, very condition of, of, of the earth. And, of, um, and so it's always surprising, and I don't know in a way why, but how life still can exist in those 
margins in a way um, and how it um, um, so living the camera for certain number of, of hours or then suddenly also you start seeing things moving that in, in places where you thought it was just a pile of, uh, of dirt and there were no insect or nothing or how specific um, detritus become a very good habitat for certain snails or um, so all of that was uh, really interesting and also bring forth this uh, patchiness and kind of like three dimensionality of, of, of that space. Um, it was every, every surface, every different, if a brick is put somewhere, then it becomes a specific sediment for a specific um, uh, cloud. So that was um, extremely, um, Kind of revealing and interesting, um, and um, um, and I think there was something. Sorry, <laughs> trying to gather my thoughts. Um, there was this idea also that Heather and I talked um, a lot about, which was um, the idea, the complexity, also of thinking sometimes about. Uh, plentiness and the plentiness of life uh, in spaces like that where you would think there are no no life and what kind of life you find and the idea that because they are eutrophic waters because they are very productive then they can have a lot of a certain kind of life in them and that is not necessarily a sign of good health of, um, of a body of water uh, so plentiness is not um, necessarily a sign of health. And that was interesting to think because eutrophication means overproduction and the relationship with um, production system. And so um, <laughs> well, that was interesting to think with. Yeah, I was just going to jump in and make exactly the same point you did at the end there, Sonia, which was about we really struggled um, with this question of um, how to in, how to engage with the abundance in the canals, because it's for the most part uh, they are full of creatures, um, but they're often um, abundant in number but few in kind and how to engage with that visually to show the abundance but to but also to show that the species diversity is often quite low um, that you're only seeing two species of fish even though you're seeing large numbers of fish um, and how to um, how to really engage with those complexities in the project. That it's neither a story of extinction and utter paucity, but of a type of simplification. And that the simplification isn't just the structural simplification in the straightness of the canal, but also the simplification of the life worlds um, within them. So, there's still this abundance of life, but at the same time, it is a, a limited um, and restrict, it's a limited and confined world at the same time. Um, thank you, Heather. And um, th th we have two other questions and before um, reading them and then slowly um, um, steering towards a, a conclusion. I, I have a, a question in relation to what you were mentioning, um, which is also an important feature in the in the in the glossary, which is this notion of the monocondition no? and the ecological simplification. And um, and my my question, which is is very present in in the film and also in a series of. Um, of exercises and of reflections triggered by groups 
such as Feral Atlas, and also touched upon in the Monsters and Ghosts and the Figures of the Anthropocene book, um, which relates to um, how, how do you think it is possible to attend to these life forms, let's say, to these animals, to these different creatures, and to their resilience and resistance? And at the same time, how can we prevent ourselves to turn them into incarnations of the situations they resist to? I'm thinking in a more general um, relationship to our lives and to our daily encounters with pigeons, for instance, or with rats. These are animals that have resisted, that are resilient. You know? um, and at the same time, they attest to a monocondition in which we have depleted our environments of the diversity of, of life forms and only those who resisted or who were capable of adapting and so on and so forth survive and actually thrive, no? And how can these creatures, um, how can they not be personified, these monsters and these ghosts of the Anthropocene and instead be seen as a symptom of the actual monsters, which are the infrastructure, the, um, the, the currents that we create and that generate the conditions for this simplification. I don't know if my question is very clear. I'm basically asking how can we, how can those uh, living forms not become tropes or figures that stand for the problem that they find themselves enmeshed in in their purification, in their proliferation and, and in their existence, let's say. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's hard. I think it's a great question. And it's the question that we've been trying to ask in better and better ways. <laughs> um, but it's the question that we're still asking. But I also think, you know, it's a general question that we often have in contexts of, um, industrialism and capitalism, because we're struggling with this. I don't wanna make a simplistic parallel between human worlds and more than human worlds. But I think when we're talking about capitalist dynamics, there's is, there is a way that we know in human worlds, for example, that we end up with the stories of the self-made man or the individual who has to be resilient. Yet we know that those stories are radically insufficient for, life in our times, whether you end up, um, you know, that um, our lives and our successes and failures are not, are very rarely personal and very much bound up with the structures with which, uh, with which our lives are entangled. And they're very, they're very not, they're definitely not individual. And we'll st we're still learning better and better ways of discussing that. And I think there's something, um, although we're dealing with a very different situation and a very different context, um, and it's not quite a parallel struggle, it's not quite a parallel struggle, um, that there is a similar way that we want to focus on the structures and the structural conditions, which is part, which is precisely why we didn't want to focus on uh, invasive species per se. And you know, we really didn't. We wanted to move away from the type of conversations that are either about celebrating the six, the resilience of the species, such as pigeons that adapt, or demonizing, say, the killer shrimp. Um, because it, there's, you know, there's nothing demonic about the demon shrimp, which is another, uh, series, like these, or nothing killer about a killer sh shrimp per se. These are not like evil beings. Um, and the same is that there's nothing and like, and like, yes, there's a degree of creativity to pigeons that we want to celebrate, but you know, these are complicated, complicated issues. So instead, we really wanted to focus on the morphological changes and the changes in form um, as a way of thinking about the types of repair um, that to, to sort of bring into spotlight 
a, a mode of thinking that would lead to different that would lead to toward lead towards some of the conversations about modes of repair, where what would it mean to make more curvy and sinuous worlds that would then uh, support different assemblages of being. Um, so I think that's what we were trying to highlight in our choices. But yeah, they're they're difficult questions with no easy answers. Well, but with yeah, thank you with a very beautiful answer. Um, I'm going to um, go through some of the questions that we have. Um, one from Olga Koleva. She says, I loved your mention to the different weather conditions under and over the water. And I'm curious about how the creatures of the lines um, or how you, Sonia, as a filmmaker have experienced those creatures on the line. And she continues and she says, I think of water creatures weathering the storm in open waters or oceans, for, for example, and the kind of multiplicity of your experience while filming. So I guess it's a question about encounter and encounter with the elements and with life. Um, thank you for that question, Olga. Um, I remember um, I have, yeah, something I would call a beautiful moment of um, the, the, the rain starting to fall and I didn't notice it um, at first, but I could see all the the fishes starting to, so the water is starting to be much more turbid and then the fishes all starting to um, uh, shelter um, on, their, <laughs> on their boat. Um, so I think a lot of the creatures of the line are used to the different uh, perturbation that either weather or passing boats or um, um, Things thrown in the water are put in put there, um, and I think, um, yeah, sometimes they even. Um, uh, I'm thinking about yeah the plastic as well in the in the snail, but um, weathering the storm. Um, uh, I don't think there is such dramatic. Um, condition in canals uh, it would be mainly like yeah the the sediment being um being churned and i know there is no not so much study being done on that but i've heard a lot of rumors about the fact that there is a, still a lot of um, heavy metals in the sediment so that's also another question to ask um, thinking about how the constant churning also um, um, has an impact on the on the different creatures of the life. Thank you. And continuing on creatures, a very, I think, quick and direct question. Mary Hayes asks, what is the creature in the image behind us? Is it microscopic? Because yes, it's a it's a flat worm. It's a type of flat worm. And yes, it's an image taken with a microscope. Thank you. And uh, Heather, um, a question for you um, is by Rose Torty. Is there a pressure as an anthropologist to put people at the center of your work? Can your subjects be non-human and that research still be considered anthropological? Um, I think there are a couple, it's a great question and there are a couple different ways to answer it. Um, you know, I think, I think for me, the question has never been about whether or not my work is properly anthropo anthropological, but about asking the question of how can anthropological tools, um, ex uh, how can anthropological tools help me to learn and be curious and to research the types of worldly dilemmas that are of interest to me. Um, and I think I'm, I'm phenomenally grateful to anthropology for everything it teaches me. But the question of whether or not I'm a, I'm a well-disciplined anthropologist um, 
has just has never been one of the primary questions for me. I actually became an anthropologist because I love salmon. So my own biological trajectory is I grew up in a salmon fishing town and was intensely curious about fish and watery worlds from the time I was a child. And I fell in love with salmon and fish first. And then I ended up at uni and I discovered that anthropology helped me to think about fish. So for me, it's always been that kind of a, an order to the curiosities. Um, that said, another answer is that multi-species anthropology and more than human anthropology are also increasingly growing and um, are increased, it's part of an increasingly growing sort of sub discipline and a part of the field. Um, and the space between the broader environmental humanities and its dialogues with anthropology um, are growing every day. So I do think it's becoming um, a more and more accepted approach within the field. Um, in many ways, moving out from the work of Donna Haraway and Anit Singh. And Anit Singh is an anthropologist who a number of years ago um, wrote, the wrote a line that was, you know, being human is a multi-species relation. Um, and that's always stuck with me as well. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, I think we're all very much looking forward um, to your salmon book that is due to come out this summer. <laughs> Um, and, um, and talking about futures, um, maybe I would just wrap up and, and conclude with a, with a question to you, Sonia, um, which uh, concerns the present future of this project. Is it, do you see it as concluded? Do you see it evolving? Or do you see it evolving into something else? Or is this something that you're continuing to work with? Thank you, Philippa. Um, we've been talking for a long time about um, developing the film also as a multi-channel work. Um, I think that was always um, the goal because it's such a, it would fit the work to be in a more immersive, non-linear um, form um, and to play a bit more with um, more uh, voices in the archive, bring more material in. But it's also been really useful to have this one channel because it can be shared more widely. Um, so that's one thing we've been discussing with, with Heather and maybe with, with Radar to see if that would be possible to, to continue some, some collaboration to develop uh, this as a multi-channel. Um, Otherwise, yeah, Heather and I are currently uh, working on a project on the Venetian Lagoon. Um, and this very much we are realizing the work of Creatures of the Line is really helping us to, to shape some of our methods or way of thinking towards um, this uh, place, even though it's um, completely different, of course, um, it's a very different type of body of water, but lines already um, somehow present, um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, I think uh, if, unless there are other questions, um, I think it's been beautiful and, um, and just an extraordinary, just an extraordinary proof of how an artwork um, is a way of discovering and knowing the world and, and a complementary and uh, sister, let's say, epistemology to that of scientific knowledge and to the humanities. Um, and I believe the film will remain available for some days, but maybe Chanan, you can let us know a little bit now. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for such a brilliant and generous conversation. Um, just to reiterate, the film will be available for another five days up until the end of this week. 
I can see some comments uh, showing appreciation in the chat. A big thank you for sharing and creating such a generous space of confabulation. So thank you so much, Sonia, Heather, Philippa, and to everyone who contributed to um, the conversation with your questions and comments. The recording of this question will be available. And if you want to trace back some of the gems that has been shared uh, in today's conversation, thank you again for tuning in. And thank you to our speakers again, Sonia, Heather, Philippa, and Lara, and all the team who supported today's event. Jim, Helen, Shannon, thank you. So a kind of a virtual applause to everyone um, and hopefully see you again soon. Thank you.